Uh, good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you to the November 18th regular meeting of council. There's a bit of an echo here, is there? It sounds like a bit of an echo here tonight. Maybe it's just me. Um, I'd like to recognize, firstly, that we are on the traditional territory of the Sinemic First Nation. Our clerk tonight will be Ms. Sheila Gurry. The question period sign-up sheet is on the partition wall near the gallery, uh, either end. If during the uh, meeting any member of the gallery has a question regarding an agenda item, please write down your name on the agenda item on the sheet. And at the start of question period, I will call up those who've signed uh, the sheet to the podium to address council. And the first item on the agenda is the introduction of late items. Ms. Gurry. Thank you, Your Worship. For late items this evening, agenda item 8B2, we are adding the Special Finance and Audit Committee recommendations from November the 15th. For agenda item 9B, we're adding a delegation from Mr. Keith Wilson regarding council support for five nonprofits applying for provincial funding for childcare spaces. And as well, Your Worship, I would just like to point out that on your agenda under um, the long list of bylaws to be adopted, 11B, the title is wrong in the, in the title. The actual motion is correct. It should be bylaw 2019 number 7187.01 and not .07 in that title. So that's 11B. So the motion is correct. It says 7187.01 and that's what the title should reflect. That's it, Your Worship. Thank you, Ms. Gurry. I would ask for a motion for approval of the agenda as amended then. Councillor Thorpe, second to Councillor Bonner. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Motion for the adoption of the minutes. Second. Moved by Councillor Martman, seconded by Councillor Thorpe. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, the Mayor's report. A number of things to report. Um, we are happy to announce the return of the Living History Speaker Series uh, for one big night, as they say, in showbiz. Uh, and that is on November 19th at the Conference Centre, uh, running from 6.30 to 8 p.m. It'll be held here in the Shaw Auditorium. Uh, the, this year's theme is Choosing Nanaimo, and speakers include Joan Brown, Chief Administrative Officer with Sinemic First Nation, Gunther Gutsche, uh, an 89-year-old boarder and post-war German immigrant, uh, Craig Taylor, local author, a Londoners and a return to Aikenfield, uh, to be introduced by Carol Matthews, local author, uh, as well known for, uh, amongst many other book publications, Minerva's Owl. It's a free event and everyone is welcome to attend. In addition, the city's happy to uh, announce the launch of the new Nanaimo map. Uh, this map will replace the legacy version of Nanaimo map, which is scheduled to be retired in early 2020. Uh, we're looking for feedback on the new layout and features before we retire the existing mapping system in January 2020. Uh, the new Nanaimo map is mobile friendly and includes new features such as trails, bike routes and aerial imaging from 1996 to the current date. The city is also seeking artist proposals for permanent artwork at Sutton Maffeo Park. Um, the artwork of timeless uh, perspective uh, are on display and seen for years to come obviously. Artists are invited to submit their proposals through Call for artists to supply and oversee installation of artwork at Maffeo Sutton Park number 2489, which is available on the city's website at www.nanaimo.ca slash bid dash opportunities slash bid underscore details dot ASPX question mark ID uh, equal 1353. Uh, and again, the deadline is Monday, January the 20th, uh, no later than 3 p.m. I'm happy to uh, confirm that the new Camby Park uh, being developed through the Partners in Park program uh, will soon include a half sport court, a community bulletin board, fencing and play equipment. Park development has been made possible by community volunteers and a number of generous donations. Uh, partners in the Parks and Partner uh, Partners in Parks program is a public participation program designed to bring the ideas and efforts of volunteers together with the Department of Parks, Recreation and Culture in order to develop more uh, and develop and improve our parks and open spaces. The improvement plan is neighborhood and initiated and driven. The pro this project will not directly impact taxes. 
and will not require maintenance by neighbors. Construction is expected to be complete by the spring of 2020. The city is seeking feedback on short-term rental accommodation. Uh, we are reviewing a zoning and business regulations related to short-term rental and bed and breakfast accommodation. A drop-in open house regarding short-term rental and B&B regulations is scheduled for November 21st from 5 to 7 p.m. at the Kin Hut at Departure Bay. That's 2730 Departure Bay Road. City of Nanaimo residents, property owners, and business owners are encouraged to attend. And finally, um, as mayor and on behalf of council and the 900 employees for the city of Nanaimo, uh, we wish to extend our heartfelt sympathies and to our director of human resources, John Van Horn, on the passing of his wife, Jenny. Uh, she fought a long and hard battle with cancer, but succumbed to this horrible disease yesterday morning at the young age of 47. Through difficult times in this city, uh, when Mr. Van Horn, as many senior staff and other staff members, faced incredible pressure, uh, trying to govern the city through very difficult times, she was there fighting her own battle and supporting her husband. To her children, Wyatt and Ella, you are in our thoughts and prayers at this very sad time. Uh, this is a heartbreaking for all of you, and we are deeply sorry for your loss. The next is presentations. Uh, we have Dr. David Copeland, uh, Dr. Joe Foster, uh, and Dr. Jody Turner. Dr. Copeland. Joe couldn't make it, and Jody, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Foster there. Uh, Dr. Turner. <laughs> Treasurer of the uh, <laughs> Treasurer of the MSA. So good evening, uh, to your worship and council members. Uh, really grateful for the opportunity to come and speak to you tonight on behalf of the medical staff and patients in Central and North Island. Uh, very humbled and grateful to be here. And tonight we're going to talk about a tertiary hospital at NRGH, and I'll explain what we mean by that and. Uh, why we need it and hopefully we can get your support. So just briefly the Medical Staff Association, uh, we are the voice of, of the medical staff. We advocate on their behalf in all issues of wellness, patient care needs, everything that the medical staff does. There are about 300 members and that's, that's, our, that's our mission is to improve things for them and improve patient care. Uh, we engage the medical staff in many things, uh, wellness events, CME, uh, engagement activities with community members, other hospital members, and we work with Island Health. It's one of our big missions, our partners at Island Health, to achieve common goals. And one of the things that we are, I'm not going to go into all the things we do, but one of the big things we do, we are involved in planning uh, through the MOA of the ministry, where we sit down and we plan with Island Health and various members. And in, and from that planning uh, sprung out the idea of a tertiary hospital in Nanaimo, and, the, and we'll talk more in detail about that. And we also engage the community, and we've been doing that around uh, Central Island uh, for the last four months, and we're here tonight to further engage the community. So a tertiary hospital at NRGH, for, I'll explain a bit what that means. It's, it's really, I wouldn't get too caught up in the term, I'll tell you sort of what we need. And, uh, but really over the, the, the fundamental thing is over the last 15 to 20 years, the growth up island and the population explosion and the demographics have not uh, been matched. The medical need and the population growth haven't been matched by programs and funding to meet that need. So, and this has been recognized by Island Health and the the board uh, two years ago. Uh, in, in 2017, a five-year plan was created for a tertiary hospital at NRGH. And that was developed by local stakeholders uh, in Nanaimo in, in partnership with Island Health. So is, what I'm presenting tonight is the, the, mostly that plan with a few additions. So it's data-driven, it's a good plan, and it gets us about 90% of the way, way to where we need to be to provide the proper care we should get up island. 
So tertiary hospital, just briefly, uh, that includes most of the programs you would think of you would normally have in a big hospital like cardiology, uh, cancer center, uh, all the medical subspecialties, gastroenterology, neurology. We would have an expansion of our current surgical programs like orthopedics and ENT to have full slates of them and call services. So we won't be do we, we're not looking for all the services they have elsewhere in some of the big hospitals like neurosurgery and cardiology and transplants, but we need pretty much everything else. And so that's how I would think of it. And I'll describe those to you tonight. So do we need a tertiary hospital? Is it justified? Well, I would say yes, just simply on demographics and population. Uh, these are stats from the BC government of 2018 that show there's 422,000 people north of the Malahat and 413 south. So we're actually over 430 now. We're growing faster, we're older, and we have the same complexity of care. We've studied that. We have the busiest emergency room. Dr. Turner, who works in that, will attest to that. So basically, acute care demands at our hospital are going through the roof, and they're going to continue to go through the roof. And the, pr the real evidence for that is on this slide. If you look at that purple line, that is the growth of the population in Central Island over 75 up to 2027. It's going to effectively double. So that has huge implications for what will be coming at the door at NRGH, and already we're a bit overwhelmed. Uh, and the other, I just want to comment, though, that you know, there's a lot of initiatives we need to do, not just in the hospital. I want to give voice to our family doctors out there. They're doing a lot of initiatives to try to keep people out of hospital, to get them out, out of the hospital into the community quickly, and, and have integrated care there with long-term and all that. We totally support those initiatives. But what we're talking about is a little different tonight. It's when you're really sick and you have to be in the hospital. That's what we're trying to address tonight. So this is just the first page of that plan that was developed in 2017. It's a public document. You can read it. It's 84 pages long. And 90% of what I'm going to talk about tonight is in there with a few add-ons that we uh, were also advocating for. So this is just a list of the executive priorities in the plan, and we're going to talk more about these, and I just include it for completeness. There were 10 of them, and we'll talk a bit more in detail about these. Uh, so the, the first priority, actually, from the plan, uh, the first medical priority, the highest one, is really more appropriate care for our critical Ill, critically ill patients in the hospital. Because really, as a, as a hospital, you have to be able to look after your really sick people or you, you haven't fulfilled your mission. So that's the number one priority. And from the, we had reports of critical care, our critical care service from 2013 and 2014, one external and one island health. Both concluded the same thing. We need a new intensive care, which it was funded by the, uh, the government, so that's, that's very great. That's, all, that's coming in 2021. We need something called a high acuity unit and complex medical care unit, which we haven't managed to get yet, but we'll talk more about that. So those are, those are from 2013, and we haven't got them. So those are things for really sick people, and I'll talk a bit more about that. And we also need to look after our really sick people more access to internal medicine specialists and subspecialists particularly cardiology, neurology, and gastroenterology. And I'm not trying to shortchange the other ones, but these ones are a pressing need. We're the largest hospital in Canada without gastroenterologists on, on site. So what is a high acuity unit? It's really a, criti criti a, a place where people go when they're really sick, but they're not intubated in ICU. If you had a heart attack or a stroke or you were bleeding, you would go to a high acuity unit where you're looked after by critical care doctors and nurses in the proper place where you get the proper care. So we desperately need that at our site because you have so many people up in the wards that are ill and don't have a proper place to go. The next thing is a complex medical care unit. I'm not getting into the details of that. That's really to help our internal medicine people ensure coverage throughout the hospital and to help the sick patients flow in and out of the hospital much better, which we need because we're over census every day. So those two things alone would be game changers for care at NRGH to look after the really sick people and we're working with the administration. We're hoping we're almost going to get a couple of wins in those regards. We haven't managed yet. We need operating dollars. We do have the space for those. So some other priority subspecialty medical programs include gastroenterology. And I mentioned we're the largest hospital in Canada without it. Right now, our foundation, fantastic work by Janice Perino and her group raising money uh, to build an endoscopy suite because you can't attract gastroenterologists without it. So we'd like to, that's coming. Uh, again, we need the operating dollars to run the suite once they come. And Island Health is helping with that. 
neurology. Uh, we, is a critical need for neurology services at NRGH. We have more strokes north of the Malahat than south. And unfortunately, we've just, uh, uh, due to a lack of support, our one neurologist has left the hospital temporarily. So, but cardiology, a little bit better story there. We have three cardiologists on site and we've got to expand the non-invasive services they're providing. And the, again, the foundation has stepped up and is raising $2 million to expand the echocardiography service there with administrative information coordinating that. But what we really need is a cardiac cath lab, cardiac catheterization lab, where, and, and that, what that means is when you have a heart attack, the standard of care in the Western world is to get a big heart attack into the cath lab within 90 minutes, and you get the artery opened up and the blood flow restored. We cannot do that here up island. We do not meet that standard of care, and we're one of the few sites in the Western world that can't do that. So that's a pressing need, and our cardiologists are the one who are advocating for that, and I believe you had a I know you had a presentation from Dr. Natarajan about that, so he can speak much better to that than me. The MSA, from our point of view, we sponsored a data gathering project for that to bring all that data together to make our case. It's, an, it's not a hard case to make. Uh, other services that are priorities are mental health. Uh, and I'm going to give you some numbers later on, but I mean, really, to look after our young kids who have uh, mental health issues and our adult population, you know, it, it, it is estimated that mental health actually affects more people than cancer and cardiac disease, and I'm sure it does actually, according to the psychiatrist. We have a desperate need for that up island, especially pediatric psychiatry. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you some numbers about that later. Uh, cancer care services, uh, that's in the, in the five-year plan. The demand is now going through the roof in, in Nanaimo. Three years ago, we saw 22 patients a day in our one chemo room. Now we're up to 34 that's, per day. That's an increase of 50%. Long, we need a cancer center. Even the cancer agency has been over and looked at our site and cited where they would put one. They recognize that. So we need to get that uh, in plan in place and when we're going to build it. I'll give you some numbers on that too. Surgical services, I mentioned we need to expand these, especially things like orthopedics and ENT. They, I, we have the same number of orthopedic surgeons that... We, when I started here, as we do now, I'm the same with ENT, 25 years ago, long time now. But, so those are things that are in the plan as well. Wound care is another one in that. So just to shift gears a bit, uh, we also need a new patient tower. I think anyone who's been in there will recognize it's 60 plus years old uh, and it served us well, but we're the only major hospital on the island that either isn't getting one or has had it done. Duncan is getting theirs next year. So we need to start planning now. Now, do we need that one to provide most of this? Do we need that tower to provide the care that I've been talking about? By and large, we can start most of the things I've been talking about with operating dollars. We can start them, in a, you know, if we got the money, we could have those programs up and running. To optimize them, yes, a new tower would be good. Certainly for a cardiac cath lab, we probably need a new tower. And a cancer center would be a separate build, so it would be a, a different building. That's how the, the cancer agency runs out of Vancouver. So we could start a lot of these programs now if we get, so we need the operating dollars, we need them as much as we can get now. We need to have a plan for that new tower to optimize the care. So we do have one tertiary program on, in Nanaimo and it's a great program, renal. And that came in 2010 and we are now probably roughly doing 50% of the dialysis patients north of the Malahat with our group uh, and 50 below south. And that's kind of the model where I think a lot of the services should be at, but they're not, and I'll show you uh, a little later what they're at. Uh, but with renal patients, usually you do get all the other, usually you have car full cardiology, full medicine, expanded surgery, vascular surgery maybe, when you have a renal program. That hasn't happened, and, and you know, I'm, well, there's, there's enough blame to go around. We're not blaming anyone, we're just saying, we, we, because of the complexity of those patients, they're very ill patients with multiple illnesses. They require more resources and more types of care. I just want to make one comment about the, the designation of a tertiary hospital too. It's not something that NIMO is standing up and saying we, we should be it. That's been chosen by the provincial government and, and Island Health when they gave us renal services in 2000. They said, okay, you're going to be the big center of Island because we're the only center that has that. And we've got cardiology here as well. So we are the designated for the tertiary site. That's not something we're, we're fighting over. We've been chosen and so we've got to get on with it. So here's, here's the numbers and I think they're, they're fairly illustrative. Some maybe not, maybe a little over the top, but they do illustrate 
what we're dealing with and, and why we need to get some of these services in place now with proper funding. Uh, so if we look at the, the, the I'm, I'm going to just start on the left hand side, it says nephro, that's the neural, the renal doctors, nephro, there's six here and seven in Victoria, so it's pretty even, I think we're hiring a seven. But if you look at gastroenterology, that's GI, that's the stomach doctors, we have none, there's 16 in Victoria. Cardiology, uh, we have three, they have 26 in Victoria, they have two cath labs, we don't have one. Infectious disease, we have two in the North Island, for all of the North Island, they have eight down there. Neurology, as I just mentioned, we lost our in-hospital neurologist because of lack of support. So we have two outside the hospital. They have 16 in Victoria. We have one endocrinologist and they have nine. It doesn't get better. Psychiatry, pediatrics, we have one, they have 10. And I don't mean to make it a them and an us, but these are the figures. So adult psychiatry, they have 82 and 54 in the hospitals. We have five in the 911 up island. Uh, uh, geriatricians, on and on, one versus seven. Respirologists, those are the lung doctors, three versus ten. Hematology, vascular surgery program, we don't have one. Probably don't need thoracics right now. But the, the big, one of the other big elephants in the room is the cancer center. There's 40 oncologists in Victoria and none up island. So that, that's fairly uh, striking. And rehab docs, we are also under service there. And they're important for getting people back out into the community and in functioning again. So, uh, you know, the, ser the, the services, this slide just encapsulates what I just showed in numbers by saying, here's what we need in, in writing. I think the numbers tell a better story. So I just put that there to show it a different way. So what, there are many benefits of a tertiary hospital to Nanaimo. Uh, obviously, I think our medical staff does amazing work, given the resources they have, that the, uh, the hospital is... Uh, uh, we are usually at, our, our, our bed funding is 340, we're usually at uh, 380 to 420. So we have 40 to 80 patients in the halls all day. The staff does an amazing job of caring for them with, with the resort and the busiest emergency. So, uh, but if we get a tertiary hospital, we, we will have the ability that patients can get the proper care they need when they need it and up island where they, it's so much better for them to get it up here. Uh, also, obviously, we'll have new people, jobs, and money in the community, and uh, there'll be a hospital campus with construction and housing and services and, and benefits in that regard. Uh, you know, and, and Nanaimo with Vancouver Island University uh, and everything else, we have the beautiful environment and tertiary hospital will be certainly a, a very desirable city to pe for people to come to. Um, and. Also, you know, we have had some preliminary discussions. Uh, if we got a tertiary hospital, we need that type of thing before you can have residents and have a medical school here. Uh, and I think if you want to look at, we all know there's a big doctor shortage of all kinds. If you, if you really think about it, if we could have 25 medical st students and technical programs around medicine up at VIU, because we we're fortunate we have a technical school as well, I think we could have a lot of those doctors stay in Nanaimo and, uh, and we would really help us uh, you know, with our, our lack of uh, physicians and difficulty in recruitment. So what can, uh, we're asking our leaders, uh, council members and the public, what can you do for us? Uh, well, you can be our voice for the five-year plan and make our plan your plan. Uh, we're, we need the voice of community leaders and people of Nanaimo and Central Island and North Island to make this happen. This hospital will be for all people in North Island too, when you've got a cancer center and stuff. Uh, the other thing I want to say is we also want to engage our First Nation partners because that, we need to make that hospital something they want. It, we want it to be their hospital as well and so, something they're very comfortable coming to and, and we're striking out to do that as well. So in conclusion, you know, equity and access to tertiary programs is really what we lack above the Manhattan Central and North Island. We're not asking for exactly the same level of Victoria. We need to be closer. We should be. And as patients and taxpayers, we do deserve a level closer to South Island. The five-year plan gets us a long way towards that. And this is a slide from one of my colleagues who's in the audience. He's a young man with a young family here, very, uh, very enthusiastic. And he, he's even a bit more, he's saying, we need the same level of care as everywhere else, including Vancouver and Victoria. And we need your help to get uh, your families the care they deserve north of the Malahat. 
And that's the slogan, it's Nanaimo turn, that's from Janice Perino, our foundation, who's very bullish on Nanaimo. So, and uh, so we have a, a motion for council, and I'm not sure the, how, how this works, your worship, so, but uh, we respectfully request that council approve a motion to support a funded tertiary hospital at NRGH, along the five-year plans and the, ex the few other add-ons, in a timeline, I guess, a, I don't know if approve is the right word. Uh, uh, okay, approved by the Nanaimo medical staff and the patients of Central and North Island, or acceptable to the patients and uh, the medical staff of Central and North Island. <laughs> so we would ask your support for that motion. I thank you very much for this opportunity, and uh, thanks for hearing our delegation. Thank you very much, Dr. Copeland. Do have some I'm sorry. Uh, No, uh, th th this, this is not a theatre, but uh, thank you for your enthusiasm. Uh, any questions, Councillor Turley? I suppose it's going through it and we're driving this. Um, that doesn't include those patients that are having treatment in Victoria or Vancouver? Well, it just from Nanaimo. That's the just one those here in Nanaimo. So the, the number is a lot larger. Yeah, and, and that's, that's the, the issue is like if you, if you get... Like, I'm a radiologist, so normally I'm early involved in diagnosing yeah. and doing a biopsy. That might take you two or three weeks before you get sorted out with us. You get a then you get referred to an oncologist, that's a month. And then you come, then you get, your treatment wait here is between two and three months. So you're out four or five months. And, that, and then, yeah, often you can get in faster down south or you have to go down south. So. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you very much, Your Worship, uh, through you to Dr. Copeland. Thank you, sir, for the presentation. Just uh, a question, if I may. You're not getting off the track quickly, <laughs> so be prepared to stand. There's four um, more. Sort of a, a chicken and egg type question. Uh, I recognize that a patient tower is something, I think, a little bit separate than what you were talking about. But in terms of becoming a tertiary hospital, do we need to fund the facility and then subsequently attract the specialists? Or do we fund the specialists? I say we, uh, not us. The, uh, the government fund the, the personnel and then find a place to put them. What comes first? Yeah, it's a good question. And people are debating that, but my personal opinion, I can't speak for everyone, is pa patients are looked after by doctors and nurses and all the allied health care. We need those operating dollars to look, we can look after them now as opposed to waiting for five, ten years for a building. Mm -hmm. uh, we do need both and, and Janice Perino is so anxious to fundraise for a new tower but and you're right though if we have the new tower attracting people will be so much easier to you know attracting those specialists and family doctors that we need if you have the new building so it is you do need both but I would put the the, the people slightly ahead of the building. That makes sense thank you. Yeah. Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Worship, and through you to Dr. Copeland. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank this you. is the second time I've heard it. Um, you were also at the council <laughs> mail luncheon. Sorry about that. Um, it gets better every time. <laughs> uh, the, uh, my, my question here is, is in the figures that you're quoting from um, uh, what we have here and what Victoria has, um, what's, what size of a building are we going to have to build to get 55 psychiatrists into a an, into an hospital I, I think psychiatry is an interesting one because we are going to really have to leverage some of those resources from the, in victoria and work with them to because people can't get the care and we're not going to be able to move 55 psychiatrists up here or hire them here that's just not realistic with such a shortage so but you're you're right because we tend to build too small uh, we tend to build these buildings and say oh well we're, we're we can fit 400 people in our, in our hospital now well it should be 400 probably we're going to need, you know, that, that study hasn't been done, but it needs, you know, we don't want to build the same size we have now. We're probably looking at 600. Royal Jubilee's 500, and, but the Vic General's <coughs> same size as us, 350. So, and they have another hospital down there too. So, you know, we have to really take a careful look at how big it has to be because we don't want to build it too small because it is going to be for the whole of Nor the North Island. So that's an important number to look at. Okay, thank you. Councillor Gesselbrock. Thank you, Worship, uh, and thanks for your presentation, Mr. Copeland, Dr. Copeland. Um, thanks. My, my question uh, is that um, table showed the resources in Victoria compared to Nanaimo, and it was, it was quite different in terms of what the resource with. Um, is the numbers in Victoria, because it's intentionally been set up to be a, uh, 
the sort of a medical hub for the entire island. And if we were to have a tertiary hospital, some of those numbers in Victoria would go down as we would move those resources up here? Yeah, well, that's what happened in nephrology, right? They, they, they were planning on having 12 nephrologists down there. And then, to their credit, when, when it got decided we would have nephrology, they didn't hire in Victoria. Instead of having 12, we now have 14 between the two places. So in theory, yes. In some, some programs, that would work really well, I think. But others, it wouldn't. You, you know, they're, they're probably still going to have a big center down there. They, they need it for certain things. And I think a lot of it was just unintended consequences. When the health authority formed, the first, the big one, all administration moved down there. And basically, as population grew, they just put more resources there to meet the needs. Mm -hmm. Probably shouldn't have happened, but it did. So that's mm -hmm. what we're faced with. And, I think you're right in some ways. What we need to do is not necessarily move those people up here, but we need to maybe put a little freeze on what's going on down there so we can attract people up here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, thanks. Yep. Councillor Hammonds. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm curious about this consistently being over census, you said. What does that look like? You mentioned people in the hallways. Are we discharging people early? Are we not taking people in in a timely I, fashion? Like, what does that actually mean for patients? Well, I just talked to my, oh, there's a bunch of my colleagues in the corner that they can tell you. They're literally in hallways, closets everywhere. And, and, and the, the administrative staff at the hospital, uh, who run it day to day with s some of the doctors and, and, and nurses who do that, uh, that's their biggest job. They spend all day trying to figure out how to move patients out, who can we discharge, because they're just, and who, the people that are in eMERGE that are stuck there, they gotta bring them to a bed where they can get cared for, and they just can't do it. So it's, we're, we're about 40 to 80% over capacity, 40 to 80 patients. We're at about 130% capacity most of the time. And so for patients, that looks, you know, you're in a hallway and you're right. really sick, and you know, we can't get them out. It's a, it's a, you know, they're trying to work on the other solution is like I said, in the community, the long-term care beds you know, getting people in a discharge plan earlier. And they spend enormous amounts of time, our administration and our, uh, you know, the docs and nurses are involved in that. That's what they do day to day. That's their biggest job right now, is just trying to sort out how can we get this sick person into where they go and move these other people out. And it's a difficult job. And is that, in your opinion, a primary driver behind new builds? So like the new Comox Hospital, the new Campbell River Hospital, is that, is that generally just a capacity issue that motivates No, I, I, don't, I don't think so. Those are just being, you know, 60 years old. You need, you need a new building with new, okay. you know, all the new modern things that we can have. It can fit computers in them. I mean, we have no room for computers or the proper. It all had to be retrofitted, all kinds of things like that. You know, the rooms are better for flow and infection and all that. There's a whole number of reasons. Uh, we do need a bigger hospital too, though, for beds. And, up in, in up there, I don't think they got much more in beds. I'm not 100% sure about that, though. Okay, and then last question: this concept of it being about um, the facility, not necessarily the capacity, would that apply for the new ICU? Because I note it when it came before the regional district, it really surprised me. It's just going up by three beds, but it's a 34 million dollar building. Yeah, so. I, um, that's a number that we have actually would like that to be 16. Okay. Not 12, the medical staff. That's our, that's our ask for that. So we're in agreement with you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Brown. Oh. Thank you, Worship. Um, thank through you to uh, Dr. Copeland. Thanks so much for the presentation. I just, quick question. You had the ask on the one slide before, um, the support, just to remove ambiguity for council, or at least myself. What does that support look like? Does that, in our conversations, we're advocating for this, or are you looking for something more official? I'm looking for you to pass that motion <laughs> tonight. I'm not looking for you. The medical staff of Nanaimo is asking you to pass that in, in our support. I think it's really critical that we get the city behind this initiative. It's, uh, I mean, you guys are the face of our, our, our city, and uh, we really would appreciate and need your support. Councillor Martman. Thank you. Uh, I would like to move that council approve a motion to support a fully funded tertiary, if I'm not saying that right, hospital at NRGH and a timeline approved by the Nanaimo medical staff and the patients of Central and North Island. Councillor Brown. Ms. Gurry. Um, Yes, Your Worship, you can completely move and second and vote on that motion right now. I would just um, 
um, for clarification's sake, um, what Councillor Brown's question was as to the support, would you like a letter of support? Or um, so a motion to support a fully funded, um, so. We'll, so we'll take both, a motion and a letter. <laughs> Sounds wonderful, thank you for that. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I think early on in our term, I made a statement uh, publicly that I would not be supporting motions that come off the floor without, without some due process. Uh, I might be persuaded to, to backtrack on that in this, in this instance, but I'll uh, defer to other councillors first. Can I speak to my motion then? Uh, councillor Armstrong and then Councillor Marmon. Yeah, I'm 100% I'm uh, in favor of this. I think it's sadly needed, especially the psychiatric needs. We have a lot of children that cannot access anybody that are uh, running scared and, and turning to other means to, to self-medicate. So 100% for this. Councillor Marmon. And I understand completely uh, first heard defer, but I think once in a blue moon there are exceptions to the rules. And I don't think this really needs much more discussion. We've had a great presentation and it's not going to require any staff work. We are sending our support that Nanaimo and the citizens south north of the Malahat uh, deserve this. Nanaimo, it's our turn. Councillor Brown. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I too sort of uh, first heard deferred, and I'm torn here at the table. Um, but uh, I think I would like just to introduce a little clarity into the motion, and if, if Council doesn't feel like that's necessary, then. Um, but I, I would propose amendment that, it's, that it would read that Council provide a letter of support for a fully funded tertiary hospital, just to remove any any sort of questions around funding or support down the line about what that looks like, um, I just would feel a little more comfortable. Is that a friendly amendment? Or? Uh, if, the, if the mover and the seconder agree to that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we're being friendly tonight. <laughs> Councillor <laughs> Hemmons. Thank you. Um, possibly in line with Councillor Brown's hesitation, um, I'm fully in support uh, the stats and the numbers speak for themselves. However, I am um, conscious of the fact that, that Council has limited advocacy resources when it comes to asking for new health care um, dollars or spending, and we do have, um, while the community physicians didn't present a motion as, as, you know, as clearly as you have, I do know that there's a lot of interest in developing community mental health and substance use resources. and. Um, so I'm in support, but I do want to, as long as we're, we're not saying that this is all we're asking for, because I think it also extends beyond the hospital and into the community. Thank you very much. I, I might say that uh, when Dr. Copeland concluded, I was going to suggest politely that we would observe normally the standard process, which is first heard deferred, which you've already heard here tonight earlier. But, um, and I'm uh, in Councillor Thorpe's camp on this and Councillor Brown as well, but I do sense that uh, given the uh, nature of the motion before us that it wouldn't be an unreasonable reach once in a lifetime of this council in any event f for us to, uh, for us to uh, perhaps uh, call the question and vote on this. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Thank you very much, Dr. Copeland. Thank you so much. No, Thank no, you. no, 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 no. Thank you. no. Can I, we're not going back to the bad old days. I, Dr. Emmons, I, you're totally right, but we're, the ho we're hospital based. We can't make a motion for the community. I totally agree. Thank you so much. Very much. Thank you very much. The next item, a motion for adoption of consent items. Councillor Emmons. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you very much. I'm going to give a minute for the uh, room to vacate. The next item is delegations. Uh, Shauna McAllister, re fire protection and life safety regulation bylaw number 2011, number 7108. Ms. McAllister. As they say in the movies, come on down. Good evening, Your Worship. It's 
Members, thank you very much. Um, not this past Friday, but the Friday before, my little son, we live on Park Avenue in Canby, right across the street from the new wonderful park. He came back in the house worried. Mom, Mom, you gotta come see, there's horrible fire all over. It's so smoky, you can't even breathe. I'm like, what are you talking about? So I go outside the street and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like crazy. Who is doing this? What is going on? So I took my camera out and I took some photos and I thought, this is crazy. Like you can't even walk, I'm covered in smoke now. The whole area was just like a deep blanket layer of smoke coming from two properties right next to the Park Avenue school. And so I phoned the fire department and they said, oh yeah, well we do fire. We do fire Fridays and Saturdays for the month of November. We do that twice a year. And I thought, okay. So that day for many, many hours of the morning, the, the smoke was so thick in that area because it's a, it's a low-lying valley area with the trees behind. And um, I phoned the school and I talked to the principal and the principal showed his support for me and he wrote me a letter. And what he, the principal had said is that numerous times this year, the month of November, and then also in the spring when they do these fire, these fire Fridays and Saturdays, the smoke was so bad that the children had to stay inside for school or for the outdoor playground time. And then, so I have a letter from Mr. Dillon, Mr. Robert, Robbie Dillon saying, this is not okay, and even inside the classroom, or even inside the classroom in the school, it was filled with smoke. So I phoned the fire department back, and I said, "Okay, guys, you guys maybe go check out these fires because I think that what they're doing, because I drove by, is they're taking a whole bunch of green material, which is maybe not the best thing for the environment, and lighting these green materials on fire. So it's just plumes of smoke, and the city right now allows one-acre parcels to have fire permits." That's maybe not the best thing for the environment, but absolutely on Fridays when children are walking to school, no thank you, please. I'm asking for an amendment to be made that the fire permits for the burn Fridays and Saturdays absolutely be stopped for Fridays within a half kilometer radius of Park Avenue School specifically because of what the fire department um, commander who I spoke with and sent emails back and forth and spoke with, he said that that area has an induction. And so he drove by after I called, and then I called again, and he said that absolutely there was an induction and the smoke was very low, and he suggested that I come down here to amend the bylaw to have a ban on Fridays for the school children. So that's my request, please, and thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Does council have any questions for the delegation? Councillor Hemmons. Thank you. Um, how often does this happen? Is it every Friday? Um, only for the month of November, right. every Friday and Saturday. And so the two acre parcels in question are right across the street from each other on Park Avenue and like one block in from Canby towards the Park Avenue school. And if there's smoke inside the school, the children can't escape it. And we all know what smoke does to our lungs and we all know that it's really not the best thing. So if those people wanna burn their wonderful green materials that they can go compost, please have it so they do it on Saturdays in and around a half kilometer area. That's, I think, reasonable. Please and thank you. Councillor Armstrong. Uh, questions for Chief Fry when it's appropriate. Okay. Both for Chief Fry. Ms. McAllister, thank you very much for your thank presentation. Thank you very much. Have Appreciate a beautiful it. night. Councillor Armstrong. If I could just have your uh, comments on that, please, Chief. Uh, through the through your worship to Councillor Armstrong. So uh, the delegation is correct. Uh, there is a bylaw in effect permitting burning on uh, Fridays and Saturdays in the months of April and November on properties greater than one acre in size uh, and properties all on Protection Island as well. Uh, this bylaw hasn't been amended for several years. Uh, I will say specifically on this day and something we haven't previously enforced is what we call a venting index. And venting index uh, really looks at the air quality. And as council may be aware, when we get a lot of stagnant air, it does sit down in many areas. Um, and it is something that we, since we've learned about the delegation, have been looking into a little bit more on controlling the pollution through the venting index. 
and restricting, potentially making opportunities to restrict burning or put, put items in place to restrict burning if the venting index through Ministry of Environment uh, designates it that it is a, a hazard. Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you to staff. Um, so, is it safe to say that this bylaw was uh, set up prior to um, our ability to do uh, waste removal through the green bins and also be able to drop off uh, green uh, material to some of the um, recycling companies around town? Uh, through Your Worship, I believe this bylaw has been uh, in effect since the 80s. Uh, with the burning, if not probably permitting burning uh, for, for longer periods than that. Uh, you will find uh, many jurisdictions across the province will allow agricultural burning on, uh, for the continuation of farming. Uh, many do have large lots of land uh, where they require that, as well as in our uh, regional district of Nanaimo. Uh, we have received several complaints before in our city from burning that occurs on the outskirts of our municipality as well. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, Sorry. The question is, um, I know that we're looking at a number of bylaws. Um, is this one in the queue to be reviewed um, based on the fact that we do provide other ways of getting rid of yard waste? Uh, through the chair. Um, Councillor Bonner, so this definitely is in our uh, work plan to review this bylaw. We have been waiting for the Fire Services Act, which is a provincial fire act, uh, to be released. Uh, at that time, it's called the Fire Safety Act with new regulations for fire protection requirements for the province or for the firefighters. Um, but in saying that, it is definitely in the queue. And as far as removing waste, well, we would leave that up to uh, Mr. Sims uh, Sanitation Department. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next delegation is Keith Wilson, re council support for five nonprofits applying for provincial funding for childcare spaces. Mr. Wilson, five minutes. At the four minute mark, the light turns orange. If you could introduce yourself, please. Good evening, uh, Your Worship and Councillors. Uh, I'm Keith Wilson, I'm working for <laughs> Nanaimo Youth Services, uh, and I have a small delegation, nothing like the hospital had, but their support is as much, I'm sure. We're here tonight to ask for your support in moving the opportunity forward for additional affordable childcare spaces in our city. As many of you are aware, the provincial government has implemented the Child Care BC New Spaces Fund which will create up to 22,000 new spaces by investing $1.3 billion in the province over the next three years. This program provides up to $3 million to a municipality for 100% of project costs to create additional childcare spaces in their community. In many cases, municipalities partner with local nonprofits, that's why we're here, with experience in working with children and youth to ensure that the project gets up and running in an effective and efficient manner. Let's see if this works. It does. Before I go into details about our proposal, I thought it might be useful to set the scene insofar as Nanaimo is concerned. And you can see the statistics on the slide. These are from the new vital signs report that was released, I think, about a week ago or so. I won't repeat the numbers that are on the slides because we can read them, but it does show that many children in Nanaimo are not in the best circumstances and as they grow from children into youths and, and older, uh, they certainly face a lot of uh, significant challenges on the way. The agencies supporting this presentation know the details behind these statistics well. They work for and support these children and youth every single day. Um, before I move on, I'll talk about who we are that's sitting back there. Uh, the five agencies shown on the slide have come together to work on this project and there are other agencies as well. Uh, I think I speak for all of us when I say that we're committed to making Nanaimo a better place 
for all people, but mostly young people including those that need a safe place to be while their parents or where, while their parent or parents are at work. They also recognize the additional benefits in terms of socialization and early learning that arise from a well-run, well-managed childcare facility. Here are some of the benefits of moving forward with the creation of additional childcare spaces in the city. A large body of research documents and supports each of these points and others. There is no downside to investing in childcare. New employment opportunities are created for caregivers and educators. Employers are better served because their employees are not worried about their kids and they can attract young, bright talent to the area because daycare is not an issue. And with more parents working, the local and regional economy gets a boost. Finally, with the province paying for the spaces, there's no good reason to delay on helping Nanaimo's young families with their childcare challenges. We're asking the city to allow us to work with Childcare BC to create additional spaces for Nanaimo by delivering our application to the province when it is completed. There is a slight squeeze on time. It has to be in by Friday. Um, we have been in touch with Michelle Kirby of Childcare BC and she has said that she would be happy to work with us to craft a successful application. We understand the workload on the city staff and don't want this to become an additional challenge one for minute, one Mr. or more Wilson. of your employees. Therefore, we're ready to do the heavy lifting on getting things moving. Um, and we'd like somebody from the city to sit in on our meetings. The yellow light is kicking me off here. Um, in conclusion, our ask is at the bottom of the slide. Uh, the only thing I would add is I heard about a blue moon a few minutes ago and with, with the Friday deadline, please let there be two blue moons. Thank you. Blue moon, but not a full moon. Councillor Armstrong. Sorry, my questions for staff again. All right. Any questions for the delegation? <clears throat> Councillor Gesselbrock. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wilson, for the uh, presentation. Um, <clears throat> just a clarity. So there is uh, money from the province uh, that is available for child care spaces. Um, and that this pot of money, uh, the due date for it to be for the submissions is this coming Friday. Um, and if we don't, if there's no submission that this money that's available for, ch for, for child care spaces will or will, will not be utilized. Is clarity on that? Um, maybe I'll go into a little more detail. There's, there's up to $4 million available to a municipality for child care development. A million of that comes from UBCM funding that came from the federal government. That million dollars applications must be in by Friday to get that money. Uh, the province also then puts in $3 million uh, in a separate program and there is no deadline on that. But we're, we're basically leaving a million dollars on the table if we don't get our application in by Friday. Thank you. Councillor Armstrong. Um, just a question perhaps Mr. Lindsay can answer. How does this relate to the last um, child care thing that came before Council? Please and thank you. Um, earlier this year, Council authorized um, application for a grant to do uh, research work looking at um, the requirements and we're partnering mm -hmm. with other, uh, other groups to do that study. So that study is underway uh, as we speak. Uh, Mr. Lindsay, are there any other um, groups, bodies that you're aware of in the city who are presently applying or considering applying or have made representations to the city or similar requests? Uh, yes, Your Worship. Specifically with respect to the Child Care BC Space Fund, this is the provincial, the, the one that's been referred to that there's a $3 million opportunity for local governments or school districts. Uh, we've had ongoing discussions with the school district uh, about them uh, proceeding with applications. So they're doing work right now. Um, their hope is to come to council in the near future um, seeking support for uh, an application. Again, it has to be on a, 
on their property or if it was, we were the applicants on our property in order to um, apply for the $3 million. Um, and they've taken the lead on that um, application so far. Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Worship. Um, a lot of this information was available for us at UBCM, but uh, I think I'm the only one that actually went to that workshop. Um, the $1 million, um, is, is some of that money available to purchase land? Yes, it is. And so, in, in essence, we could get $1 million and $3 million to build a facility on land that we could purchase? That's correct. And what are the requirements um, um, for once we do get this money, what does a province require uh, of the city or of the organization running it? I'm, I'm not sure of the, the details. Uh, they want a 15-year commitment uh, that the development will operate for, for the 15 years. Uh, there's no other financial commitment. I, insofar as our proposal is concerned, there's no ongoing reporting requirement from the city. We would take care of that. Okay. And then at the end of that 15 years, it's, it's our property and our building. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Councillor Hammonds. Thank you. Um, a question for the delegation. Um, you referenced that $1 million could be used to purchase land, but your third bullet point in your ask is provide property for the development of the facility. So if, if you're successful in, in receiving the $1 million, do you plan to use that to purchase land? Well, it, we're flexible. If, okay. if if we got the million and you don't have land, we'd, we'd be happy to invest in the land. I see. And a question for Mr. Lindsay. Um, in your understanding of this program, what would be the chances of having two successful proposals in one community? Your Worship, it's, um, it, it's, I gotta be careful how I answer that because there's, there's multiple sources of funding here. So on the UBCM funding, it has to be local government that applies, has to be on, on city property. Um, my understanding is one application can be made by the local government. On the application to the province, there could be multiple applications made from multiple groups. For example, the school board in the city are both eligible under one branch, and I think nonprofits, I believe, are eligible under uh, another uh, branch. So there could be multiple applications from one community on the provincial grant application. Follow up, if I may. Then, if we, if we, in theory, approve this, and um, with a million dollars you purchase land, and then we have multiple applicants, is there is there a scenario where you could have purchased land with the million dollars, but the school district is awarded the three million dollars? The. Uh, the I guess it's important to note first of all that the UBCM grant only the city can apply for that grant. Right. And that money can be used for land acquisition. Acquisition doesn't have to be. It could be, for example, used uh, in addition as part of capital, as part of the $3 million to have $4 million to, to build a project on city property if we were applying to the province for the other $3 million. Okay. For the other $3 million. I'm sorry, I'm not sure that answers your yeah, question. Yeah, it does. It does. Thank you. Councillor Gesselbrook. Thank you, Worship. Um, Question for Mr. Wilson, um, and then a, a question for staff. Uh, one, um, is there uh, any discussion of collaboration with the school district on, 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 on child care spaces? We haven't collaborated with them to date. Okay. I wasn't aware that they were working on it, actually. Um, and the, the second question um, for Mr. Lindsay, um, I think I, I'd hate to see a, a million dollars uh, of, of, of funding uh, not be utilized, especially for, for child care and something that I think that there's a growing need for. Um, I'm curious, um, this is obviously quite close of a proposal to the, the Friday deadline and, and, and does not give council really the time to, to do proper due diligence. Um, however, uh, is there a way that we can apply for this $1 million uh, and secure it through the city and then proceed through uh, whatever needs to occur uh, to, to move forward depending on what, what, what partners? Um, to your worship, I think 
I think there's a number of questions that would need to be answered before I could comfor comfortably say yes. And one of those would be, if you were just applying for the $1 million, um, obviously, depending on the scale of the project, it might not be sufficient to build a building, certainly not enough to buy land and build a project. Mm. Um, and also, in terms of the application itself, it, it talks about the need to have a budget and conceptual drawings and you need to be uh, prepared to have it open and operational within two years uh, from the day that, that, that uh, grants provided. So it's a very, very short time frame, and I think it suggests that there's something that's shelf ready to, uh, to be built. And to uh, follow up on that uh, to, to Mr. Wilson, is there anything of the proposal of that, that case that is in that state ready to, to go? Uh, yes, we've got the application for the UBCM money just about done. It should be done by tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Then it'd be ready to come to staff, I guess, and have them review it and do what they will. Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Worship. And maybe to help out with some of the conversation here, um, I will be putting forward a motion later in the... Um, in the, at the later part of our meeting regarding this delegation. Um, but the, the $3 million isn't just one $3 million. We can get the $3 million, tee it up with the $1 million, build a facility, and we can go right back the next day and ask for another $3 million to build another facility, and we can go back and buy another, get another $3 million to build another facility. School board can do that as well. So there's, there's, there's an opportunity here to create an awful lot of daycare in our city and have the province pay for it all. So that's, we can just keep going as for it. Councillor Turley. Thank you, Worship. Um, through you to uh, um, the delegation. I, I, the curious, the, I know maybe I missed it when you presented it, but um, the actual maintenance of the building once it's built and also the operation of the daycare, uh, who funds that? Um, we would propose that, that we would come together in some form uh, as a nonprofit probably and that organization would would be the ones that would look after the operating costs the actual operation and maintenance and all of the other stuff and we would be the nonprofits not the city you're talking that's about. right okay thank yep. you councillor brown thank you worship um councillor bonner and we've addressed my question but it'd be through you to mr lindsay um, i just wanted to confirm that um multiple applications to the province can be made and the second question would be that um, the school district can apply to the province uh, in of itself not necessarily doesn't necessarily require the municipality to apply on their behalf sorry your worship that's that's correct and that's what i was saying earlier there's really two different streams that we're talking about uh, the ubcm um, application which is is uh, coming up quickly um, that's different. Only local governments can apply, obviously, to UBCM. That's a one-time ask for a million dollars. The, the other fund, the provincially funded through the ministry fund, um, it can be multiple asks in any jurisdiction, as, as, as Councillor Bonner uh, mentioned. Thank you. Just a quick follow-up. Um, obviously, we haven't heard from the school district yet, so it would be safe to assume that their timeline and you know, obviously they're a large landholder as well, um, that their timeline wouldn't be seeking the UBCM uh, funding? Your Worship, I, it, in general, my understanding is they wouldn't be eligible for the UBCM um, unless there was a, and we'd have to look into this more closely, but if there was some partnership, for example, that had school board and city property, then possibly, but I think we'd have to get some clarification from the province around that. But generally, the funding from UBCM is for um, property, on city property or on property that we have a long-term lease on. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to the delegation, uh, thank you, Mr. Wilson. Uh, first, I totally respect the work that you do and the organizations that you're representing here this evening. Uh, that said, you heard my comments to the earlier delegation, uh, and I meant them. Uh, you're putting us, I feel, in, a, in an awkward position here, I have to tell you. Uh, obviously, Council has a number of questions. This involves much more than simply a letter of support. Uh, and I know I would appreciate a lot more background detail, uh, 
uh, from staff uh, to feel comfortable supporting this. I, I'm not saying I won't, and I know there's no motion on the floor right now. But can I just ask you, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I have to ask, when the deadline is Friday, why are we just getting this ask now? It's really putting us under the gun. Um, to the best of my knowledge, the reason that it's here is that some of the organizations have been working with staff, your staff, and it hasn't been moving forward. So because the deadline was coming up, uh, we decided as a last, last attempt to get it here before the deadline. Okay, thank you. Councillor Armstrong. Yeah, I agree with uh, Councillor Thorpe. I need some more information. I heard from Mr. Lindsay that if you are successful with that million dollars, the project must be up and running within two years. And is that feasible if the land hasn't been purchased, if it's going to take some time to find it, to get a contractor? So, I, I, you know, for me, I, I can't support without a staff report outlining all those concerns as much as I would like to. But I need, I need more, far more information. Thank you. No further questions? Can Thank I, you. Can I respond? Well, actually, can Chris Beaton respond to that? Yes. Chris Beaton, I'm with Nanaimo Aboriginal Centre. Councillor Armstrong, just to respond to your, your question. Um, we do believe we can get a new facility up and running in the next uh, 24 months. In fact, uh, there is a six-month extension built into the application, and I think UBCM along with the province of BC is eager to assist municipalities um, in getting new childcare spaces up and running. One of the proposals that we have discussed with city staff, and in fact, city staff, Mr. Harding from uh, Parks and Recreation suggested that Bevan Park might be an ideal site. So land acquisition wouldn't be part of this proposal the way we're drafting it at the moment. It would be to uh, develop 96 licensed childcare spaces at Bevan Park uh, with a capital budget that we've put together um, that would total about $3.9 million. $0.9 million coming from the UBCM application that, as Mr. Lindsay says, only municipalities can apply for, and the other $3 million through an application to the Ministry of Children and Family Development that has the uh, child care capital grants available. And again, as Mr. Lindsay has said, multiple applications uh, are invited and encouraged uh, this provincial government has committed to opening 22,000 childcare spaces within three years. They're getting close to the end of year two, uh, and I think their numbers are at about 12,500, so they've got another 10,000. They're eager to get spaces open. They're eager to, eager to get capital dollars out to communities. Um, and as one of the other councillors said a few minutes ago, it's a real shame if we can't uh, submit an application for this $1 million dollars. There was an intake process in January of this year that was not, uh, there was no submission made. Um, and so we're, we just heard about it, I think through Councillor Bonner about three weeks ago, began meeting with staff right away um, and are here uh, now asking for council support to direct staff um, to support an application to UBCM so that that million dollars is not lost uh, to our city and community. Councillor Hammonds. Thank you. Um, at the risk of, of making staff uncomfortable, um, what I have in front of me is, is, is a fairly substantial ask, um, but without having seen the proposal and hearing that um, talks to date with staff haven't been perhaps as productive as, as you would hope that would bring this forward in a timely manner as, as Councillor Thorpe um, suggested. So, my question is for Mr. Lindsay, if you could provide any sort of um, summary to us of what, is, is there staff reservation? Um, why is this coming to us so late, I guess is my question. Your Worship, sorry, I can't speak for Mr. Harding. My understanding is that the group did uh, have a meeting with Mr. Harding and other staff to talk about. Uh, the potential, but certainly no um, commitments for staff. Our focus right now has been based on implementing staff or council direction, sorry, which was the study. So that's where staff's energies have been focused. We have had some discussions, as I mentioned, with um, the school board, and unlike the the city, which doesn't really have a um, traditional role in um, operating childcare, certainly the school board actually sees themselves expanding the current service they provide to provide for all ages. So it's actually 
um, something that they're looking, I shouldn't be speaking for the school board, but in our discussions with them is something that they're looking into and expanding. So they felt that um, building on their property was the best opportunity. Um, and they've talked to us about supporting those applications. Again, doesn't mean that test can be the only application under that uh, opportunity. There could be multiple, but that's, that's the discussions to date. Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, if you were so inclined, I could put my motion forward now. Um, I was going to bring it up in other business, but um, we can certainly put it forward now if you're inclined. Um, Your Worship, either or um, other business is appropriate for matters on the agenda, um, but you can also, arising from a delegation, make the motion now. Councillor Bonner. Thank you. If I may. That staff work with the Central Vancouver Island Multicultural Society, Nanaimo Aboriginal Centre, Nanaimo Boys and Girls Club, Nanaimo Food Share, Share Society, and Nanaimo Youth Services Association to submit an application for child care spaces funding from the province of British Columbia. Second. Seconded, Councillor Martman. Discussion? Councillor Gesselbrock. Oh, uh, but Councillor Bonner, you put the motion forward. Go ahead. Um, when I heard about this money um, at UBCM, I was I thought this is a grand opportunity to um, basically um, provide childcare spaces uh, in our city, um, and it's being funded through, in this case, the federal government and also the province, and. Uh, we are not necessarily in the business of child care, but we certainly are in the business of um, having land and building buildings, which we do on a semi-regular basis. Uh, and this is where I see this as. We, uh, we do this sort of type of work with a number of organizations around, around town. And uh, I just think this is an opportunity. Um, it's also a, um, as I've mentioned before, I believe that child care spaces in our community is an economic driver. Uh, for bringing in new businesses here uh, that they can afford that and it's also uh, child care spaces that people can afford uh, is a way of uh, increasing our children at risk as they enter school system so these are sort of the reasons that I think this is a, um, an, a, not, uh, a great opportunity and not something that we should uh, miss out on thank you Councillor Gesselbrock thank you worship um, this is a, uh, a timeline that uh, is an ideal. Uh, however, um, I think that we've got a provincial government that's ready to put money into something that's very important. I know that there is, you know, from conversations, a shortage uh, of childcare, and we're a growing city, and it's something that's a really necessary resource. This is why our, our province has been so proactive on this. Um, I, I hate uh, the thought of, of missing out on the opportunity for a million dollars for child care and I think that uh, you know we are working at capacity with our staff there's a lot of things going on uh, in Nanaimo that our, our attention is being directed to that we have to and, and, and by no means do I want to burden staff uh, mm -hmm. that are already working uh, extremely uh, hard on, on many many items um, and, and, and with saying that I think that we need to lean on our, 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 our nonprofits um, and leverage the resources uh, that are out there with groups that are willing to put the effort and time into, into making these things happen. And, and uh, I, I think, well, it's like, let's make hay while, while the sun shines, the, the funding's there. And so I, I'll be supporting this, um, this uh, motion going forward. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you. Councillor Hammonds. Thank you. Um, I'll also be supporting the motion, but I, I would like to say, with reservation, um, this seems like a fairly large ask um, and a lot of faith, but I do have faith in the, um, the organizations that are here tonight and represented, um, so I'm in support. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, through you. Uh, Regretfully, I will not be able to support the motion uh, for the reasons that I think I've already indicated. Uh, this might be an opportunity for provincial funding, but there's a lot of long-term ramifications to the city. And I am frankly just too uncomfortable about making that commitment without more background information and rationale. And for example, I heard Mr. Beaton refer to Bevan Park. 
uh, as a possible site. That's the first I've heard of this, and that would involve major discussions. So that's just a, a small example of my discomfort. So um, it, it's with regret, uh, because I do appreciate the work that the organizations are doing, and I recognize that this is an opportunity, but I think, in my opinion, for Council to, to uh, immediately react to this request such a big request without due diligence uh, would not be good governance. So I'm sorry I won't be supporting it. Councillor Armstrong. Um, I concur with the comments made by Councillor Thorpe, and I just have a question if this is to go. What projects will staff have to give up in order to do this? Because they're already at capacity, so obviously something has to give. Your, Your Worship, I appreciate uh, the question. Obviously, if this was a priority for Council, we would, um, we would make that happen. The, part of the difficulty I'm going to have is an, in answering that question is I'm honestly not sure um, the amount of detail and work that needs to go into making an application. Um, our understanding, our conversations with UBCM to date is their expectation is that there be a budget and conceptual drawings and a plan for this project. At this point, I don't know where based on the motion on the, on the floor, I don't know where we, we would be even identifying the property if we were making that application. So it's more the unknown, um, the uncertainty in how that application would be rather than the staff timeline. And follow up if I may, so obviously they want conceptual drawings, so who's gonna be responsible for the cost of that? Does it come from the nonprofit? Does it come from the city? Those are questions I have. Who's responsible for the maintenance? No, you can't have a conceptual drawing if you don't have the land. You don't know where it's going to go because you don't know what the building lot size is. So those are concerns I have. Which land is available? I just can't, with, with four days' notice, make such a big decision. Thank you. Councillor Cheerley. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you to, I believe, Mr. Wilson. Um, I don't know if I heard correctly or not, but I, I thought I heard you say that the application form is just about ready to be handed in. Is that, is that for something else, or is that for this one that the city has to do? No, <clears throat> excuse me, that's this application. It's, it's virtually done. So it would not involve, involve a lot of city staff time, is that? Through you to Mr. Lindsay, is that an appropriate question? Sorry, Your Worship, I have to ask Councillor Turley to repeat his question. I was having sure, a side well, conversation. I'd, I'd be happy to, yeah. <laughs> Um, the question I asked of Mr. Wilson was the, I heard him indicate that they were talking about an application form that was already almost to go in. And then I'm hearing that, you know, we need to, from through Councillor Armstrong, that there's conceptual drawings, et cetera, et cetera, that need to be done with the application. So I'm a little confused as to, is it ready to go in or is it still involving a, a lot of have, work? Staff have not been involved in the preparation of, a, of an application, if that's, mm -hmm. if that's the question. Sorry, your, through your worship, that's, um, we've not been involved or reviewed an application, though. So then back to Mr. Wilson. So is that required from city staff or are you all ready to just uh, submit it? Um, the city has to submit the application. Uh, yeah. From our perspective, we we did as much of the work as we could to be ready. So so, I don't think staff was the the ones that had to fill out the application. Um, so we've gone ahead and done most of that work. There will be some some work needed over the next few days with staff to to kind of get everything organized. But for the most part, the the information is there. Okay. Mr. Rudolph. Your Worship, just a point of clarification on the intent of the motion and vis-a-vis -vis what's on the screen. I see the note that the, the, what the, the ask to the city is to provide property for the development in the central part of the city, but the motion didn't specify that. It said, did, did not just say to work with the proponent and make the submission. So is it your intent to commit the property or is, was it just to make the application and we'll work out the details later. It's an important question because uh, Mr. Lindsay and I have been talking about even thinking of a property that might be a candidate for this. It's, you know, it needs to be thought through a bit and then there's costs and all sorts of things. So um, I'm not sure that we could, without going out and acquiring property, uh, necessarily find a site that's suitable for this. So there's a, just a question around the property piece and is that, 
is that still fluid or is that, I think I heard earlier that, that it possibly could be done, done separately, but uh, because the ask is, it's stated in the last bullet of the slide that there is an ask for property as well in the sense and specifying generally the area. So just a clarification, I guess, would be helpful. Ms. Gurry. Thank you, Your Worship. So um, Councillor Bonner could probably um, speak to this as well, but that motion that's on the screen isn't the motion that Councillor Bonner made. Councillor Bonner made um, a motion um, basically setting out what is in your agenda that um, Council directs staff to support this group with their application. Um, so not what's on the slide there. However, if that information that's on the slide there is needed for the application, Mr. Rudolph's questions um, may need an answer from Council. Councillor Martman. Thank you, Your Worship. I seconded this motion to get it on the table and to have discussion, but I too am having my concerns now. I mean, I, I'm the last one that wants to be caught in bureaucracy and I love to make motions and get things done, but I think in this case, there's too much unknowns for us to be able to support it. We're asking to submit an application which the delegation feels is mostly complete, but we're also hearing from city staff that there's more information and more work that has to be done. I'm very sad that this is Monday and it needs to be in on a Friday, um, but I don't think I can support it the way it is. Councillor Gesselbrock. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this, this doesn't feel great. Um, and I, I'm curious, in the proposal, what is the site that uh, is being proposed to house this child care facility? Because I imagine what the ask is to the city provide property for the development of a child care facility. Uh, yeah, what, what, what is in the proposal? Yeah, um, as I said, we were taking direction from city staff um, not to begin looking at a piece of the property. In fact, to, to quote a city staff person, it was, why spend money on property when we have acres and acres of property? Uh, we looked uh, back to the uh, 2017 decision by city council on the redevelopment of Bevan Park and that master plan uh, and looked at some of the footprints that were allocated by city council for facility development led by community. And it was that discussion that we started to unfold with uh, city staff. And so our proposal again is to look at Bevan Park so that, that we do not require a purchase and you to use the the funds in that capacity but to actually look at planning and uh development of 96 licensed child care spaces at bevan park so so the just to, to clarify the location is to bevan park then that would be uh, that's correct would be. Uh, in in conversations with city staff two options were presented to us from their perspective as ideal locations one was chase river i'm sorry i don't recall the name of that small park in chase river and the other one was bevan uh, bevan seemed to be more ideal in terms of um, central location and closer to the sort of families um, those vulnerable families that the UBCM grant uh, hopes to support. Um, it's more targeted, the UBCM grant, um, than just the broad community, but looking at, looking at those vulnerable families, newcomers to the, the city and the country, to Indigenous uh, children, um, to those living in poverty. So. Thank you. Councillor Bonner. Thank you. Um, to answer the earlier question, it was just my intention that, um, that staff work with the applicants um, and sort out the details. I don't think we're here to specify land or anything like that. Um, and I think it's kind of clear that a number of conversations have already taken place at the staff level. Um, it's just here because we're under time crunch because it has to go in this Friday. So uh, I'm, I'm quite um, happy with, with the proposed, with the motion as it stands and uh, just that staff work with the proponents to get this in by Friday. If we don't get it, we don't get it, right? But at least we tried. Councillor Hemmons. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm really stuck on this idea that, that it needs conceptual drawings and we don't yet have a confirmed location. Um, it seems like a very practical piece that needs to be addressed. <coughs> 
in four days' time. Um, so I'm, I'm right on the fence right now, obviously. Okay. Councillor Brown. Thank you, Worship. Um, thank you for the proposal and thank you for the conversation. Um, I, I think what we're sort of debating here is the urgency of the $1 million from UBCM. Um, and do we break from process? Do we, you know, is breaking from process worth submitting an application that you know might not have the fully thought out um, and, and fully conceptualized plan that would make an ideal application? Um, but there, what we're talking about is that four million dollar proposal. Uh, what I'm wondering here is, um, with some of the unknowns, and you know, I'm highly supportive of. of of trying to, to get facilities in our community, however so, but I, I'm, I'm worried here that we might be trying to rush to create the perfect and it might be standing in the way of progress. And so I'm, what I'm curious is if we can provide direction to staff to, um, that I think would be captured in this motion actually because it's quite open-ended, um, to work with the providers that maybe uh, maybe a space can be identified um, that makes sense and, and there's time for it to come back to council if there's some land considerations um, that might be applicable for the three million rather than rather than the full four million um, and there we might not be breaking from process as much we might not be committing ourselves to uh, decisions on so, some unknown factors and I, and, and I think the unknown factor is is a problem. Um, one for council confidence, um, and I'm hearing some of those concerns, but also uh, ensuring the success of the application. Um, so, um, sort of just speaking my thoughts, but I'm thinking here that you know, directing staff to work with the applicants uh, or the, the delegations here to to maybe refine the proposal and and come back with some considerations if it makes sense for uh, something that's uh, eligible for the three million dollar proposal not necessarily meet the deadline though for the uh, for the additional one million from UBCM. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you your worship. Uh, I'll speak once more quickly on this. Uh, uh, I'm sorry there's just too many unknowns for me and supporting the application it seems to me uh, starts us down this road and should it be successful which in, on the one hand we would hope it was then all of a sudden we're into a bunch of other commitments that have not been thought through on. And uh, I'm very concerned about that. And again, um, the reference to, to Bevan Park, and, and I was involved with the Bevan Park Master Plan revision several years ago, which, which uh, talked to proposals such as a cultural center, uh, a multi-use uh, facility for the uh, farmer's market and so on but uh, childcare spaces was not part of that conversation as I recall. So um, to me, I'm hesitant to start us down a road that uh, we don't really know where we might end up without more information. Thank you. Ms. Gurry. Oh. Thank you, Worship. I was just going to suggest that maybe if we were done asking the delegations questions, um, and you, while you're having your debate, um, well, they could sit at this point while you're debating that. Uh, Councillor Brown wishes to ask a question. Thank you, thank you, Worship. Um, through you to the delegation. I, I know uh, we do have a motion on the floor, but uh, if you'll give me the liberty, is um, would simply working with staff for a potential three million dollar application without the UBCM additional funding would that be something that uh, your group of organizations would be interested in as well? Um, to answer your question, um, Councillor Brown, I'll start by just responding to Councillor Thorpe as well that um, the cultural facility that was proposed and um, supported uh, conditionally in 2017 included 70, 72 licensed childcare spaces at Bevan Park. Um, yes, I mean, we're always happy to work with city staff. Um, $3 million means a 25% cut. Um, in the number of childcare spaces that we would have liked to have seen um, within this proposal. So going down 96 minus 25%, I don't know what that number is offhand, 70 something I guess. Um, it means changing the proposal for sure. Um, but yes, happy to work with city staff. As I said earlier, the provincial government certainly is eager to partner with municipalities and nonprofit groups to hit their 22,000 childcare space uh, target. 
Um, and if we can support them in doing that, we're happy to work with city or school district or anybody else who wants to work together. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, you mean humor me, your, your worship? Give me a chance. <laughs> uh, um, is, uh, do we have the ability to ask for an extension from UBCM? Yeah. Um, there was an intake process in January of this year, so this is the second call. Uh, we understand this is part of a federal uh, provincial partnership that provided the one time only monies to UBCM. Um, and I don't believe there's going to be another intake, nor do I believe that they would extend. We could certainly ask. We haven't asked that question specifically of UBCM, but I'm very doubtful um, given the sort of demand for those monies as well. Um, it's rare to be able to partner with UBCM and the Ministry of Children and Family Development for combined $4 million capital grant um, to any municipality. So. Um, but to answer your question, Councillor, I don't know specifically, but I'm doubtful. I am extremely appreciative of the good work of the five organizations done, and I say this with no small amount of pride, that at various times I've donated money personally to each and every one of them over the years, and I value their contribution to the community. And I am always moved by the prospect that we might provide appropriate child care, particularly for a community that uh, is enjoying an economic boom and where child care is extremely important. Mm -hmm. Having said that, however, um, we are trying to work in partnership with the school district, school board, the board of trust, board of education locally. We have not, as a council, discussed this with them. Uh, it is fairly clear that they have a strong and ongoing interest in pursuing this themselves. This isn't as if we set out a, send out a letter or notice to the community saying, all nonprofits, please come and knock on the city of Nanaimo's door. We're very interested in applying for these monies and we'd like you to make proposals to us so that we can give them the kind of due and appropriate consideration that council under all the policies and principles of good governance should in fact undertake every time they do this. Um, I am with Councillor Thorpe and Armstrong and others on this one as much as it is appealing to uh, just say, oh, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. Uh, it goes against everything that Mr. Cuff tried to uh, teach us around first heard deferred. This is not with great respect uh, to uh, Mr. Wilson's very um, uh, timely argument that, well, you've done it once um, in, tonight. Uh, mm -hmm. There is one thing to provide a general letter of support for a public hospital in a community that will be paid for by other levels of government. In, and in particular, the regional district of the Nine was to 40% of capital costs, yes, as I look at the chair beside me on my right. Uh, but this is not that kind of letter. This is to make an application on the city's behalf. We have a reputation to uh, improve and enhance with the provincial government and with great respect a last minute application uh, to any provincial authority at this late day uh, in the game I think would be embarrassing, will not enhance or improve our reputation and will frankly enjoy little chance of success and the only thing that will do for it is indeed diminish that reputation. Uh, it is fairly clear and with no disrespect to the delegation when they're telling me that the application isn't finished from their perspective and it's Friday and you're asking for a million bucks plus another three, with great respect, um, I cannot support the motion to, to work with this application and support it. Uh, in due course, it's clear the province, as has been pointed out by the delegation itself, uh, will provide more funding for childcare. It's an important issue for government. They campaigned on it. But this is not the opportunity uh, for this council to provide that kind of support, uh, particularly, and most particularly, without a staff report in front of us and not one of us ever having seen the application that we're being asked to approve. I'm happy to hear from anyone who wishes to comment after my comments, but if not, I'm going to call for the vote all those in favor of the motion? Contrary? Motion is defeated. Thank you. I appreciate your time tonight, gentlemen. Thank you.
The next item is reports, rezoning application number RA398-307 Hillcrest Avenue and 308-326 uh, Wake Asai Avenue. Mr. Lindsay, please. Thank you, Worship. As, as you mentioned, this is a rezoning application in the 300 block of Wake Asaya to rezone the property from R1 and Core 1 uh, to mixed use corridor zone Core 2. Uh, the, the current uh, plan that's been submitted with the application includes approximately 162 units of student housing and three commercial retail uh, spaces. There is an air photo on attachment E in your package this evening. Councillor Martman, would you oh. care to make the recommended motion? Yes. I'd like to move that zoning and oops. Is my mic on? Uh, not anymore. <laughs> is it now? It is now. Oh, okay. Um, that zoning amendment bylaw 2019 number 4500.164 to rezone 307 Hillcrest Avenue and 308 and 326 Wakasai Avenue from single dwelling residential R1 and residential corridor COR1 to mixed use corridor COR2 with site specific student housing use past first reading. Seconded, Councillor Brown. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Councillor Martman. Motion that zoning amendment bylaw 2019, number 4500.164, pass second reading. Seconder. Councillor Bonner, any discussion? Councillor Hemmins. Thank you. I have a question for staff. Um, the community amenity contribution on this one uh, has me curious. So the, the applicant is proposing um, that the CAC be applied to exploring and facilitating an active transportation um, around micro-mobility sharing services. So I'm guessing those are those kind of scooters that you can use. So my question is, we have a lot of active transportation projects kind of backed up. And in this area in particular, we're looking at Wake Asaya, um, at, at, you know, for cycling lanes, et cetera. So <clears throat> I'm just kind of curious between allowing the applicant to suggest what the CAC should be devoted to and when we get to say, actually, we agree with the active transportation piece, but we already have active transportation projects that we'd like to fund. I don't see it. I'm, I, and I'll be really blunt and say I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm kind of curious if they're, this is them f um, funding a feasibility to stu study to see if these little scooters would work. Um, so certainly through your worship to Councillor Hemmins, part of the community contribution was, suggest <coughs> was suggested to be just that. And I believe it was $10,000 is the number I have in my head, $10,000 for a study on the small scale um, transportation the feeling was, I think, from the proponent and our group was that the location, its location, proximity to the university kind of made it an area where you may want to look at that more closely. The, the balance of the community and many contributions was, uh, could be more widely used and on, could be used on a variety of um, active transportation projects with the focus being in and around uh, that neighborhood. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Councillor Marmon. Thank you. I'm just a little confused because my next motion reads a little bit different than what's printed, but motion that council direct staff to secure the community amenity contribution, road de dedication, works and services, and a housing agreement should council support the bylaw at third reading. That's it. Seconded. Councillor Turley. All those in favor? Sorry? That is quite different. So I'm just looking for some clarity from staff on that. Yeah. Um, I'm going by the agenda. I'm not going by the staff report. Right. I just want to make sure the agenda is the correct one. Um, just one moment, Your Worship. I'm just looking at the rec recommendation I'm looking for the recommendation that's there on the front page of the staff report. So it should match what's in your agenda. And so if it doesn't. Um, Quite right. It's your, your worship um, thing. Go, go ahead, Dale. So I was just going to say that the recommendation that's in the report is the correct one, and specifically, it's missing 
the public walkway and lot consolidation for some reason are not in your in your uh, in your agenda package, but it's the motion that's in the report. Which one should I have read? The uh, one the one you see on the screen. The the one that's on the screen, Councillor Martin, okay. if you wouldn't mind, thank you. Page eighty in your agenda if you're looking Can at I redo that then? Um, if, if we could just get council, the mover, and the seconder to agree that you're moving that with the um, walkway in the motion, and we have that recorded in the minutes, you can proceed with the vote. So Agreed, councillors? Yeah. We're all clear now for the record, Ms. Curry, what the motion's going to be? Yes, clear. All those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, the next is official community plan amendment. Stepping out on this one? Ah, yes. Thank you, Councillor Bonner. We'll try to be quick. The next is official community plan amendment application number OCP90 and rezoning application number RA423 4392 Jingle Park Road. Mr. Lindsay. Attachment D of the package be brought up. It just might help with the introduction. It's the air photo if council's looking at, looking at their own package. Uh, this is an OCP amendment and rezoning application for a relatively small uh, piece of property, 725 square meters. Uh, the OCP um, redesignation uh, from neighborhood to corridor designation with the accompanying rezoning from R1 residential uh, to core two, your worship. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Martman. Do you want to? Thank you. That the official community plan amendment bylaw 2019 number 6500.041 OCP 90 to redesignate 4392 Jingle Pot Road on the future land use plan map one from neighborhood to corridor past first reading. Seconded. Seconded Councillor Thorpe. All those in favor? Opposed, motion carries. Thank you. Councillor Martman. Move that official community plan amendment bylaw 2019 number 6500.041 pass second reading. Seconded. <clears throat> Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed, motion carries. Councillor Martman. Move that zoning amendment bylaw 2019 number 4500.153. RA 423 to rezone 4392 Jingle Pot Road from single dwelling residential R1 to mixed use corridor COR2 past first reading. Seconded. Seconded Councillor Thorpe. All those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. Councillor Martman. Move that zoning amendment bylaw 2019 number 4500.153 past second reading. Seconded. Seconded Councillor Thorpe. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Move that council direct staff to secure road dedication infrastructure upgrades vehicle access across the adjacent property and a community amenity contribution prior to adoption of the bylaw. Should council support the bylaw at third reading? Seconded. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. The next is rezoning application number RA439-847 Bruce Avenue. Mr. Lindsay. Welcome back, Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, next item on the agenda is a rezoning application for the subject property in order to allow the site-specific use of cannabis retail store. Mm -hmm. And delegations? Please. Now's your opportunity. If you could introduce yourself. Council, my name is uh, Keith Barbone. I'm here on behalf of the applicant or uh, part of the application team for the next two uh, rezoning uh, proposals. Uh, it, initially, we just asked to, uh, through advice of some assistance, uh, we're getting with these applications to. Uh, former delegation in the event that we saw some correspondence that need to be addressed in advance of your consideration um, and speaking to staff and uh, and through open houses that we've had we have uh, seen limited, limited kind of pushback that uh, requires uh, addressing tonight we're, we're hoping that if uh, first and second read are granted that we will uh, we will address any questions at the public hearing thank you any questions for the delegation Seeing none, Councillor Martman. 
thank you. Move that zoning amendment bylaw 2019 number 4500.162 to rezone 847 Bruce Avenue to allow for a cannabis retail store as a site specific use in the neighborhood center CC2 zone. Pass first reading. Seconded, Councillor Bonner. All those in favor? Opposed, motion carries. Councillor Martman. Move that zoning amendment bylaw 2019 number 4500.162 pass second reading. Seconded, Councillor Turley. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed, motion carries. Councillor Martman. Motion that council direct staff to secure the amenity contribution prior to adoption of the bylaw. Should council support the bylaw at third reading? Seconded, Councillor Bonner. All those in favor? Opposed, motion carries. The next is item D, rezoning application number RA440-5800 Turner Road. Mr. Lindsay, please. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, Worship. This is also a rezoning application in order to permit cannabis retail store. Uh, in this case, the subject property is 5800 Turner Road. Again, uh, Mr. Barbin, do you wish to speak to this one? Well, that saves questions for the delegation, doesn't it? <laughs> Councillor Amartman. Thank you. Move that zoning amendment bylaw 2019 number 4500.163 to rezone 5800 Turner Road to allow cannabis retail stores a site specific use in the city commercial center CC3 zone. Pass first reading. Seconded. Councillor Bonner. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Councillor Martman. Move that zoning amendment bylaw 2019 number 4500.163 pass second reading. Seconded. Councillor Turley. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Councillor Martman. Motion that council <coughs> direct staff to secure the amenity contribution prior to adoption of the bylaw should council support the bylaw at third reading. Seconded. Councillor Turley. All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you very much. We're now on to bylaws. The first is General Fund Asset Management Amendment <laughs> Bylaw 2019, number 7186, decimal 01. Councillor Martman, you may wish to take a drink of water first. You're going to have a long evening. <laughs> Move that General Fund Asset Management Amendment Bylaw 2019, number 7186.01 to amend the general fund asset management reserve fund purpose be adopted. Seconded. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favor? Opposed, motion carries. And Ms. Gurry, this is... <laughs> <laughs> was, it, was it something I said? <laughs> sure. Perhaps, uh, Ms. Can you worship? <laughs> what was your question? I just wanted to confirm this is the one that yes. uh, needs correction for the record. Yes. Yes. And and. Um, what was the correction? It should be point zero one, not point zero seven. Point zero one. Oh, I have point zero one. Motion itself is correct, but not, but not the title. So, on to item eleven B, sewer fund asset management amendment bylaw two zero one nine number seven one. 87.01. Move that Sewer Fund Asset Management Amendment Bylaw 2019 number 7187.01 to amend the Sewer Fund Asset Management Reserve Fund pur purpose be adopted. Seconded. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. Ms. Gurry will be sorry she missed all the fun. <laughs> all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. The next is C, Water Fund Asset Management Amendment Bylaw. 2019 number 7188.01. Move that Water Fund Asset Management Amendment Bylaw 2019 number 7188.01 to amend the Water Fund Asset Management Reserve Fund purpose be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. The next is item D, Highway Closure and Dedication Removal Bylaw 2019 number 7292. Move that highway closure and dedication removal bylaw 2019 number 7292 to provide highway, 
highway closure and dedication removal of Lubbock Square adjacent to 618 Fitzwilliam Street and 285 Prideaux Street be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Turley. All those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. The next is item E. 911 Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw 2019 number 7295. Move that 911 Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw 2019 number 7295 to establish a 911 call answer service reserve fund be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Turley. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Next is F, Cart Replacement Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw 2019, number 7296. Motion or move that Cart Replacement Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw 2019, number 7296, to establish a residential solid waste cart replacement reserve fund be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Turley. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Isn't this fun? <laughs> Item G, Copier Replacement Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw 2019, number 7297. Move that Copier Replacement Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw 2019, number 7297, to establish a Copier Replacement Reserve Fund be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Turley. All those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. The next is item H, Emission Reduction Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw 2019, number 7298. Move that Emission Reduction Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw 2019, number 7298, to establish an Emission Reduction Reserve Fund be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Turley. All those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. The next is item I, Housing Legacy Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw 2019, uh, number 7299. Move that Housing Legacy Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw 2019, number 7299, to establish a Housing Legacy Reserve Fund be adopted. Moved. Seconded, Councillor Bonner. All those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. The next is item J, Information Technology Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw 2019, number 7300. Move that Information Technology Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw 2019, number 7300, to establish an inf Information Technology Reserve Fund be adopted. Seconded. Councillor Turley, all those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. The next is item K, Nanaimo District Secondary School Community Field Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw 2019, number 7301. Move that Nanaimo Di District Secondary School Community Field Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw 2019, number 7301, to establish a Nanaimo District Secondary School Community Field Reserve Fund be adopted. Seconded. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. The next is item L, Parking Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw Number 2019, Number 7302. Move that Parking Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw 2019, Number 7302, to establish a Parking Reserve Fund be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Bonner. All those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. The next is item M, Property Acquisition Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw Number, uh, pardon me, Establishing Bylaw 2019, Number 7303. That Property Acquisition Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw 2019, Number 7303, to establish a Property Acquisition Reserve Fund be adopted. Seconded. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. The next is item N, Strategic Infrastructure Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw 2019, number 7304. Move that Strategic Infrastructure Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw 2019, number 7304, to establish a Strategic Infrastructure Reserve Fund be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Bonner. All those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. The next is item O. Sustainability Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw 2019, number 7305. 
Move that Sustainability Reserve Fund Establishing Bylaw 2019, number 7305, to establish a Sustainability Energy Consumption Reduction Reserve Fund be adopted. Seconded. <laughs> Councillor Brown. <laughs> All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. What did you do in the war, Grandpa? <laughs> Housing Agreement Bylaw Number 2019, Number 7306. Move that Housing Agreement Bylaw 2019, Number 7306, to authorize a housing agreement for rental housing at 1400 Wingrove Street, be adopted. Councillor Bonner seconding. All those in favour. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Gesselbrock, for your benefit, it's merely a suggestion. What of importance did I do in my career? And tonight was preside over the recitation of a number of bylaws to which no one is paying much attention, unfortunately. Uh, item Q is just the bylaw status sheet for information only. We have no correspondence. And on to notices of motion, Councillor Hemans. Thank you, Your Worship. I'll take the first one and then leave the second one to Councillor Brown. Um, so I'm bringing forward a notice of motion that a report be prepared for Council with a draft policy and framework for ensuring gender parity on all city committees and task forces. Thank you very much. Councillor Brown. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, we'll put forward the notice of motion that a report be prepared for Council with a draft policy and framework for reimbursing child minding expenses for members of council and city committee members that are incurred as a result of participation in official city of Nanaimo meetings. Thank you very much. Uh, no other business? Uh, Pardon me, <coughs> Councillor Gesselbrock. Sorry. Thank you, Worship. Uh, just uh, following up on a delegation by uh, uh, a parent of uh, school children at Park Ave. Um, I, I do understand that the bylaw is under review for burning. I, I, I do hate to think that uh, we've got school kids uh, going to school surrounded by smoke un unnecessarily. So um, I was wondering if I could put a motion that staff prepare a report on short-term mitigation measures to avoid smoke interference by fall and spring burning at schools. Ms. Curry. Um, thank you, Worship. So I'm. I'm I might need Council Gesselbrock to repeat that because it is a bylaw, so we would actually need to amend the bylaw in order to change the bylaw. So right. it is in the queue. Um, I don't think we can put in short term measures that contradict the bylaw. Okay. I, I think, in fairness, Councillor Gesselbrock, and well spoken on this particular issue, as it involves the health of children who have no choice but to attend that school and the teachers and staff and those living in the neighbourhood. Um, I think Chief Fry is, is well attuned to the concerns that were raised tonight. Uh, and Mr. Rudolph, I think you want to say something? I think we're under other business now. <laughs> uh, that uh, Chief Fry could be, or staff could be asked to prepare a report uh, to provide some further clarity on this. And from there, you could make some decisions around options if you wanted to move forward. I think she could also bring forward some clarity around what they are currently doing and on the inversion and what the bylaw says. And so there might be some tools there that you're interested in anyway. And I'm sure she could probably uh, update you on the, the provincial initiative that's uh, either pending or when that's happening and how that relates to this. So I think if, if you framed it just as terms of getting an information report on this so that you could make an informed decision, that would probably be safer. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm more than happy with that. Just information report and following up on what she was talking about inversions and what we can do right. to ameliorate the situation. Thank you. Your co comments are appreciated, Councillor. The next is question period. Mr. Barclay, 9B. Thank you, Mayor and Council. So I'm glad uh, uh, that uh, six of you chose to be uh, prudent stewards of taxpayers' monies, not to be reckless in the, the, the decision you made tonight. I was kind of sitting on pins and needles throughout that. I think that uh, isn't right that uh, you or I should have to go through that. So my question is, it's a question I asked to the previous council and it was never resolved, is when will council stop accepting financial asks at general council meetings. As soon as it appears that money is being sought or property, the delegation should be stopped and there should be no more consideration. When that doesn't happen, it will continue to occur and have three more years of this. So again, my question, when will you stop accepting financial asks at general council meetings? 
I think that's a very good question, and I see it more as a piece of advice than a question, Mr. Barclay, and I think uh, everyone here tonight uh, hears you uh, and your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gurry. Thank you, Your Worship. So um, I believe I've maybe brought this up before with Mr. Barclay, but we do have our delegation requests specifically ask and make them state if it is a financial request, and then we do forward them to finance and audit. Um, this delegation request didn't state that they were asking for financial matters until they were here. Um, it is up to council to stop them at that point. However, they just were asking for staff support on an application. So the funding wasn't clear in their application. We do everything we can in order to prevent financial asks coming to council meetings and direct them to finance and audit. Uh, thank you for your comments, Ms. Gurry. Rereading uh, the way the delegation has worded it, um, I think we may have given them a loophole, but the advice is timely. I would happily attain. Oh, Councillor Turley. Thank you, Your Worship. I just wanted to just follow up on Mr. Barclay's concern. And the reason I asked the question about whether the application was completed or whether it was going to be staff involvement, uh, we didn't really get a clear answer on that, in my opinion, which is one of the reasons why I did not vote in favor of it. But in fairness, uh, his comments maybe it wasn't, we weren't aware it was a financial request up until almost the end, so. Thank you very much. A motion for adjournment? Motion to adjourn. Seconded. Councillor Bonner, all those in favor, motion carries. Thank you very much.